Good morning, church. Are y'all happy out there? Did you have a good week? Did you get blessed this week? Then let's give God a great hand. If you can't do nothing else, if you can't do nothing else, let's just thank him. Thank him for what he's done for us. Because he's been mighty good to all of us. And before I go, I just want to say that I love all of you. I love you. And I'm so glad God placed that, placed that in my heart to just have love. Because you got to love. And amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come and with thanksgiving in our hearts just... Thank you, you Heavenly Father, for a wonderful week that everything went well. And Heavenly Father, that we were able to see our brothers and sisters on this Sunday morning. We thank you, you Heavenly Father, for just allowing us to, to be here in this sanctuary one more time. And we say thank you, Lord. And then, Heavenly Father, we... Thanking you for just going with us as we go. You fed us. And Heavenly Father, you let our cars come, Heavenly Father. And, and then, Heavenly Father, you just thanking you for the food and the shelter and everything that you've given us. And we say thank you, Lord. And then, Heavenly Father, we thanking you for your grace. And Lord, we thank you for mercy. Heavenly Father, we know that we all are work in progress. Heavenly Father, but you are so good and you're so kind and you said that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. That you'll be with us always, even to the end of the world. And we say thank you, Lord. And, and then, Heavenly Father, we ask that you forgive us for our sins that we do. Because you know you are a kind God and a forgiving God and we thank you for that, Heavenly Father. And then, Heavenly Father, as we travel a long life journey, Heavenly Father, that you lead the way for all of us, Heavenly Father. When we're broke, when our hearts have been broken. Heavenly Father, you help us, Heavenly Father, because we're all standing in the need. And Heavenly Father, we love you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. would this morning as the lights come back on open your bibles to genesis chapter 3 genesis chapter 3 and take time to turn your chairs around if you need to Genesis chapter 3. This morning, it's the first Sunday of Advent, and so over the next uh, four weeks counting today, we'll, we'll turn our attention to different aspects of, of uh, the Christmas story. In the Christian calendar, um, this is the beginning of a new year. Uh, the new year starts with the first Sunday of Advent, and so that's why, and then it goes into the birth of Christ, and then the rest of the uh, uh, year um, will follow from that. But these four Sundays leading up to Christmas are called the Advent Sundays. Another thing that goes on during this time of year is not only is this Advent, that's from the spiritual side, but on the secular side of things, uh, between now and Christmas is a major time uh, for new movie releases, right? During the summer, you have movie releases, and then the next big time of the year is right around Christmas. Some have already been released, but between Thanksgiving and Christmas, you've got all these new movies that are coming out. So here are some upcoming movies. Some of these may be already out. And by the way, when I show you these movies, these pictures of from the, some of the movies, I'm not necessarily endorsing them, all right? I probably won't go see any of them myself, but just for to set the stage for Advent, here are some movies that are coming out. If you have children, there's a really good chance that you've got to go see Frozen. At least that's what I've heard. I have no idea what it's about. 
Um, uh, Misty was reading something last night and said that the one of the reviews was it's supposed to be the greatest Disney movie since the last Disney movie that was out. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But anyway, Frozen, it makes me cold just thinking about it. But Frozen is, is coming out, if, or may have opened this past weekend. Another one that's coming, if not already out, is The Hunger Games. Catching Fire. Now, I have no idea about that movie as well. So I'm not a movie critic. I haven't read the books. I didn't see the first movie. It's going to be a series of movies. But I know a lot of people are into that kind of uh, movie. So The Hunger Games. A third movie coming out. Now, this one I'm interested in. Um, it's um, uh, The title of it is Saving Mr. Banks. And from what I can understand, it's the story, a true story, of Walt Disney and the lady who wrote the book, Mary Poppins. And apparently when he tried to get that uh, permission to, to make it into a movie, she kind of uh, didn't want to do that. And so at least that's the, the idea that I get. And Mary Poppins was apparently based on a real character that she knew. Uh, but anyway, so that one's coming out, and that one kind of looks interesting uh, to me. Another movie that I'm sure my son will want to go see is The Hobbit, uh, The Desolation of Smog. I have no idea what that means. Um, I like uh, uh, J.R. Tolkien, right? Isn't he the one that does The Hobbits? He and um, C.S. Lewis and some other guys uh, were Oxford. They lived in Oxford, England. Um, some of them were teachers, some of them weren't, but they gathered at this pub called um, The Lion and Eagle, I think it was, and uh, would come up with these stories as well as talk to each other. And, and when I was in Oxford, I went there a couple nights to, uh, to eat <laughs> uh, there at, at, the, at the pub where they were, and they've still got a table. And, and there's an, a, one elderly man who still goes there every night who was personal friends with C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and all those guys uh, that came up with these fantasy. And a lot of them have spiritual undertones uh, in them. Uh, from that. So The Hobbit, maybe that's one you want to go see. Now, one that I probably will want to go see uh, is this one. <laughs> Medea's Christmas. Yeah. Kelly's going to be upset she wasn't here today just to see that picture. Uh, but anyway, uh, that might be a good one uh, to go see. And usually Tyler Perry has a good message behind the comedy um, as, as well uh, from that. Production companies, when they put out these movies, production companies use trailers to try and convince you to go see their movies. You know, the trailers. And uh, if you go to a movie, if you get there before the movie starts, you've got to sit through 15 or 20 minutes of coming attractions where you just see one trailer after another. Now, I don't go to movies very often, but just to be honest with you, I kind of like that part. Uh, I like kind of seeing what's coming up. And so I don't mind. A lot of people, they want to skip that part. But there's something about watching those trailers and then you decide if, if, if you want to see that or not. The trailers um, kind of give us these coming attractions. Now, sometimes, however, and I'm sure you've experienced this, the trailers are better than the movies themselves, right? All the funny parts or everything, all you got to do is see the trailer and that's better than the whole movie. But anyway, there's another movie coming out. This movie doesn't come out until March, I think, is when it's supposed to be released. And I'm really interested in this particular movie. And so I want to show you the trailer uh, to it. So let's get the lights again, just so we can see this trailer a little bit more. A trailer of a movie that's coming out, make sure the volume's up, coming out in March. They said that one day, if man continued in his ways, the Creator would annihilate this world. It cannot be averted. He speaks to you. You must trust that he speaks in a way that you can understand. I saw water. Death by water. Nice on your life. A great flood is coming. We build a vessel to survive the storm. We build an ark. What do you want? You don't know your king. There isn't anything for you here. I have men at my back. And you stand alone and defy me. I'm not alone. It begins. desperate and there will be many. Take the I see how hard this was for you. 
remember, Noah, I chose you for a reason. Is this the end of everything? Look at Noah. Now, I think if I can get past Noah having an Australian accent, I'll enjoy the movie. But it kind of makes you want to go see a movie. The trailer tells you what's coming. Now, what does that have to do with today's sermon? Well, trailers show you what is coming. Trailers are an advertisement. The purpose is to build excitement. And to build anticipation of what's coming. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. These are the four Sundays, again, I've already mentioned this, but they're the four Sundays that lead us up to Christmas. And the word Advent means coming. The idea behind Advent in the Christian calendar was to spend some time preparing ourselves for the coming of the Messiah. And there's kind of a two prongs to it. We, we prepare ourselves for the coming of His birth uh, through celebration, but we also prepare ourselves for His future coming when He comes again. And so the purpose of Advent is to help us prepare for the coming of the Messiah on Christmas morning. And the very first announcement in Scripture of the coming Messiah is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Look at that verse. It's on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. But Genesis 3.15, God is speaking. This is right after the fall, and we're going to back up and read some of it. But God is speaking, and he's speaking to the serpent, which, is, which was Satan. And God says to him, I will put enmity, which is strife, uh, hardship, uh, war, basically. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. So in other words, God is saying there's a day coming when somebody's coming. There's going to be strife or war between you and this person who's coming. I kind of wish that last phrase was reversed a little bit because it would make a little bit more sense as far as the way things go. So let me kind of reverse it. And so he says, I will put in between between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. You will strike his heel. In other words, the things that you do to this Messiah that is coming. And of course, we know that eventually that was crucifixion. But all that's going to be like striking a heel. Now that hurts, right? I mean, you've hurt your heel before. I mean, that hurts really, really bad. And so God was saying, you are going to hurt this person, but it's going to be like a strike on the heel compared to what he's going to do to you. You will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. In theological terms, Genesis 3.15 is known as the Proto-Evangelium, which simply means first gospel the first mention of the gospel proto evangelium in a sense the other trailers are advertisements in a sense you could say then that genesis 3 genesis 3:15 is an advertisement of coming attractions and so let's go back and look at genesis chapter 3 and read up till verse 15 Of course, in Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 2, he kind of repeats that. Uh, the story of creation, emphasizing the creation of Adam and Eve. And God put Adam and Eve in a garden. And he gave them the responsibility to name all of the animals. And it was a perfect existence. And every day, God would come down and personally commune with Adam and Eve. Because God has always wa wanted to be a personal relationship with God. And so things go along, but then in chapter 3, things change. Adam and Eve sin and bring sin into the world. So let's, let's read this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, and notice that it was a serpent. It doesn't say snake. It just says serpent. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, and so before the fall of man, there was this communion between people and animals where somehow they could communicate or whatever happened. Here is the story. The, the serpent who represents Satan is going to talk to Eve. And so he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now God had told them they could eat from all the tree, any of the trees except for one. Now isn't that human nature? Uh, we, we, can, we can have all this stuff, but the moment somebody says don't do it, that's exactly what we want to do. So did God really say that you, could, you, that, that you could eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Verse 4, You will not surely die. See, the number one thing Satan tries to do to get us off track is to doubt God's word. Number one thing. God didn't really mean that. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God, the only reason God's told you not to do this is because he's out to ruin all your fun. He doesn't want you, he, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she, shook, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, because none of us like to sin alone. We always like to bring other people down. Misery loves company. So she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. In other words, up until that point, they were innocent. And now, they're no longer innocent. Verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? The greatest damage that sin does is sin separates. Sin separates. It separates us from God. Up until this point, Adam and Eve had this perfect communion with God. Now, God knew where they were. But that phrase, where are you, just shows a sign that now they had moved away. They were separated from God. Sin separates us from God, and sin separates us from one another. And that is the greatest damage that sin does. Hell is eternal separation from God, you see. And that's far worse than any flames or anything that you hear about hell. The horribleness of hell is that God is no longer present. And imagine how bad things are when God is no longer present. Sin separates. Where are you? Verse 10, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. You see, there's a separation now of people to people. God says, Where are you? So there's a separation from God and then immediately one person blames the other person for their mistake. Separation. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman blames somebody else. The serpent deceived me and I ate it. You see, it's never our fault, is it? It's always somebody else's fault. And then in verse 14, God starts to curse the different parts of creation. Sin has now entered the world. We are separated from God, from each other, and we're even separated from the creation. So the Lord God said to the serpent... Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life, which is where the image of the serpent being a snake comes from. But it's a serpent. 
And then, get this, Adam and Eve have just sinned. Creation is now cursed. They are separated from God and there's even separation among each other. Things have gotten bad. God's creation has now fallen. And immediately after the fall, immediately after Adam and Eve had sinned, God starts to provide a plan. He curses the serpent and then he says to the serpent in verse 15, And I will put enmity, strife, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Now get this. In the Jewish custom of the day, women didn't really have a lot of uh, say-so. You weren't considered to be part... Another offspring wasn't considered to be her offspring because the woman doesn't... She provides part of it, but not... You know, I don't need to go into birds and bees, right? But all, in, all through the Bible and even through history, we still, when we tell people who we are, we'll say, my name is Kevin, the son of Ken. Because you see, the offspring always goes through the father, right? The seed comes from the father. And so here is, here is God saying, I'm going to put in between, between you and her and her seed. Here's what I'm getting at. Not only is this a prophecy about the coming Messiah, but it's a prophecy about the virgin birth. All the way back in Genesis. It's going to be from her seed. This seed's not going to have a normal earthly father, in other words. And so I'm going to put in between, between you and her seed. The custom would be his seed. Her seed. He will crush your head. And you will strike his heel. So God tells Satan, look, one day the Messiah is coming and you're going to torture him and eventually you're going to crucify him. But there's another day coming when he's going to completely destroy you. And you see this thing carried out throughout Scripture. Paul writes to the Christians in Rome who were going through persecution. He tells them, you hang in there. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Listen to me, believer, whatever you're going through, however down you feel, however defeated that you feel, the promise of Advent is that, yeah, right now your heel may be sore, but one day God is going to crush the enemy. So hang in there just a little longer. And then, finally, in the book of Revelation, we read these words. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. You're going to crush his, you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Now, What's the lessons from this? I didn't really know what to call this. Applications, lessons, takeaways, just whatever you want to call it. What do we learn from this proto-evangelium, the very first gospel in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? Well, here are some lessons. Lesson number one. God always has a plan. There's nothing that's ever caught him off guard. He's never scratched his head and thought, well, I didn't see that one coming. He is not surprised by what you're going through. He hasn't been caught off guard. He is still in control. And I guarantee you that no matter what happened, God has a plan. Look, put this in perspective. Here he is. He had just created the world. He created the thing perfect. And and there seems to be no reason why anything bad should happen. But something bad happened and immediately God had a plan. He's never caught off guard. He has plan A, plan B. He's got a plan. Now, I know for some people that messes up with his sovereignty, but I don't explain it any way you want to. I don't care. All I know is God 
always has a plan. Things may look chaotic to us. We may not understand why things are going on. But we can know for sure God has a plan. He's got a plan. And He always has a plan. He's never caught off guard. The second thing we learn... is we learn some things about God's plan. For example, I think we learn that God's plan is right. We may not like it. We may wonder why. We may question it. But you can rest assured God's plan is right. It's the correct thing that needs to be done. You know, sometimes we're, you ever wonder if, if this is a good plan or not. Lord, should I do this? Should I, is this the right thing to do? God has never asked himself that question. Is this the right thing to do? He's got a plan. His plan is always right. His plan is always just. It's the fairest thing he can do for everybody involved. It's just. Here in this life, we have all kinds of injustices. But God never has a plan that's not just. He always has a plan. His plan is right. His plan is just. And third... His plan is full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. He's got a plan. He didn't have to do what he did. Once Adam and Eve sinned, he could have just started all over again. He could have, he had every right within his, within his sovereignty and his holiness to just destroy everything and start all over. He had every right, but he had another plan. And his plan was right, his plan was just, and his plan was full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. He didn't have to do what he did. He doesn't have to forgive us. He doesn't have to extend to us grace and mercy and forgiveness. But that's what he chose to do. He has a plan. His plan is right. His plan is just. And his plan is full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Kind of reminds me of this verse back in Romans. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. You see, what are you going through? What issue are you facing? What obstacle do you, are you facing that seems so big? What is it that you're thinking, I, mean, I can't even get in the holiday spirit because I've got all this stuff going on in my life. God has a plan. And if you will trust and follow him, we have this promise. His plan is that he will work it out for the good. He doesn't say that it's good that what happened to you. Because no, what Adam and Eve did was not good. But he turned it into good. What happened to Jesus was not good. But he turned it into good. And so whatever you're going through, it may not be good. It could be far from good. But rest assured, God has a plan. It's right, just. It's full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And if you just keep following him, he'll work it out to your good. Now, this brings us to the third. God's plan is all about reconciliation. That is at the heart of his plan, reconciliation. It is right, it is just, it is full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. But his plan is all about reconciliation. He didn't have to do what he did. But the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, he immediately started to reach out to reconcile himself with them. He didn't have to. But his plan was about reconciliation. Now, turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. God always has a plan. His plan is right, just, and full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness, and his plan is all about reconciliation. Look what Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter five, verse sixteen. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. 
though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, notice, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. His plan is about reconciliation. Instead of destroying us, God wanted to be reconciled with us. And the only way he could be reconciled with us is he had to deal with sin because of his holiness. And the, and the punishment for an eternal God is eternal death. And so for you and I to pay for our own sins involves eternal death, which in essence is what we cannot pay for. And so God, out of his love, wanted to reconcile us to himself. And the way he did that was sending himself, Jesus, who is an eternal God. And so Jesus could do in a moment of time what it took us an eternity to do. And so through the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ, God has reconciled himself to us. Not us to him, but he to us. Emmanuel, God with us. Look what it says. Verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then notice the next phrase. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Look. Every Sunday we come to the table for communion. And it's emphasized. Through communion, we are reconciled with God so we can be agents of reconciliation to other people. That's what he says. All this is from God, verse 18 again, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That is our message. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him... We might become the righteousness of God. You see, God always has a plan. His plan is right, just, full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. God's plan is all about reconciliation. But here's the fourth takeaway. When we reconciled, we are joining God in His plan. Please get this. You want to know what God has called you to do? God has called you to, first of all, be reconciled with Him. Second of all, to be reconciled with each other. And to seek reconciliation. And now what we just read... God has reconciled you through Christ and has given you the ministry of reconciliation. So you go out into the world and you tell people, be reconciled to God. And so you know what? When I go out of my way and try to be reconciled with that person who has offended me, I'm doing God's work. When I go out of my way and try to, to step out of my comfort zone and reconcile myself with other people of different races and classes and economic positions and all, when I seek reconciliation, I am doing what God has called me to do because He's reconciled Himself to me and given me the ministry of reconciliation with others. You see... I'm not doing God's work by sitting on the sidelines and being grumpy and bitter at everybody. I do God's work by seeking reconciliation with Him and with others. God's got a plan. He's always had a plan. And even though we may not understand it, His plan is right, just, and full of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. The bottom line is His plan is all about reconciliation. And the way you join God in His work is by reconciling yourself with Him and with each other. 
That's Advent. That's the first gospel message. Advent prepares us for the coming Messiah. And it teaches us that God has always had this plan. He wants us to be reconciled with himself so we can be reconciled with each other. And you see, the reason that's the plan is because the most dangerous thing about sin is that it separates. And since sin separates us from God and each other, God's plan is to reconcile us with himself and one another. It's the gospel. When we seek reconciliation, we're joining God in his plan. And so, Christmas is not about gifts, but about God becoming man so we could be reconciled to him and to one another. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day. And Lord, I know I find comfort in the fact that no matter what's going on in my life and in the surroundings around me, that you have a plan. It's not my job to understand it and explain it or try to figure it out. It's just my job to follow you in that plan. And Lord, the reason you sent yourself through Christ here so that we can be reconciled with you so then we can go and be reconciled with each other. And even so we can be reconciled with creation. Help us, Lord, just to follow your plan, to place our faith in Christ. And then to reach out to those around us and see how we can be reconciled with those who for one reason or another seem to be different and seem to be far off or who have offended us or whatever it may be, Lord, your plan for us is to join you in this plan of reconciliation. To call people to be reconciled to you, but then also to be reconciled to each other. We thank you for that. Challenge us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would, stand with me and let's close with this benediction. Say this with me. Not me, but we. Not them, but us. Not us, but him. Amen. You're dismissed.